Hello, and welcome to the Frictionless Experience, the podcast where we lay waste to digital friction. I'm Chuck Moxley. And I'm Nick Palladino. Now, on today's episode, we're continuing our deep dive into the five friction forces that are impacting your customers' digital experiences and focusing specifically today on aesthetics. Joining us is an expert on this topic, Paul Stonick. Paul is the VP of SCADPRO, the in-house design research and innovation studio at the Savannah College of Art and Design. Now, SCADPRO teams students with brands to develop new ideas, including digital experiences for leading brands like Google, Amazon, Apple, NASA, and Uber, to name a few. Paul is the former director of online user experience as well for the Home Depot, VP, former VP creative and global head of user experience for Barclays Investment Bank, <clears throat> and served in digital design roles with Bloomingdale's, Viacom, and Avon. Paul, welcome to the Frictionless Experience. Thank you, Chuck and Nick. Great to be here today. Appreciate it. <clears throat> awesome. So, Paul, tell us a little bit more about SCAD Pro and your role there. Yeah, absolutely. SCAD Pro is our in-house design research and innovation studio where we partner with big name brands, which you mentioned, uh, to solve problems through design thinking. Uh, we work with 45% of the world's most inf influential brands. Uh, if you think about some of the work that we've done with Google and Delta, Disney, Coca-Cola, Ford, uh, if you've ever been through a Chick-fil-A drive through that was a SCAD Pro project that we did. And you know how good it is because using a framework of design thinking, the best thing or the worst thing about design thinking is that the word design is in the title. It's really all about solving problems through a human centered design. And that was a project that we accomplished in terms of improving the outdoor dining experience, which creates value and impact in return. That's return for Chick-fil-A because you're going through the drive through faster. That's return for the customer because you're getting your food faster. Um, so we'd like to think of SCAD Pro as really our finishing school. It's the stepping stone into students' creative professions. At SCAD, we don't think of ourselves as an art school. We think of ourselves as a creative university preparing students for their creative professions. The way SCAD Pro works is that we bring students together, about 15 to 20, to work with a professor, and they solve the problem that the company comes to us with, solving through design thinking. That could be digital, it could be physical, it could be digital. Uh, we do about 20 to 25 partnerships per quarter, and uh, it's an amazing experience for the students because they really get this inside out internship where they're getting direct access to a brand partner. Uh, to date, we've had 8,000 students come through the program. Uh, we've done 700 partnerships to date. We've launched 70 products in the market. And our favorite, most important statistic is that we've hired almost 250 students directly into these companies. And that's exactly what we do in support of our mission, preparing students for their creative professions. Wow, that, that's very cool. So let me just get this straight. You came up with the idea to have the people in the Chick-fil-A line with the tablets taking the orders in advance. Is that Was that one of your ideas? That, that was a SCAD Pro project. It predates me, but it was a SCAD Pro project because it's one that everybody can relate to. Every time I ask the question, right. whether it's at a SCAD day or prospective students or we're creating business development, I ask the question, who's been through a Chick-fil-A Chick drive-through? Almost everybody. And they understand the experience. It's like, oh, that was us that came up with that in terms of the outdoor dining experience. So we're proud to say that was a SCAD Pro project. That's pretty fascinating, honestly. Just, just the fact that that came from a a student led mentality. Like that's really, really cool. That's, that's cutting edge stuff in, in a, in a big way. It really is. You know, with SCAD pro, this is not student work. This is agency level work that you're getting. Right. And the outcomes are really, really impressive. So, you know, companies come to us because they want this unconstrained thinking. They're coming to us to teach them how to be creative again. Hmm. Every company's creative, but most companies forgot, right? So we go in there now and teach them how to be creative again through design thinking having unconstrained thinking, Gen Z mindset, and really thinking through what could this possibly be? So this futuristic thinking as well. Um, so it's really a great opportunity for the students to bring their disciplines to the table, but they also get the soft skills at the same time. So you're bringing students together from 100 different majors and minors to collaborate, but they're also getting communication, teamwork, listening, leadership. These are all the things that they're gonna need when they go into their real professions, they're gonna have to be able to work together to execute and solve problems. And I mean, Chick-fil-A is, is such a good example of a frictionless experience. I mean, you see that line and you don't even care, right? It could be way out onto the street and that's, that's a true story near me. It could be way out onto the street and you're not worried about it because you know it's going to be fast. That's exactly right. I think with that type of experience, Chick-fil-A has established trust. 
So right. when you see a long line, it's like, okay, I can hang in there. It'll go through pretty quick. That means we've provided outcomes, we've provided proof, and we've provided trust to the customer as well too, that you will get through it and it'll be accurate as well too. Um, you know, and it's funny because going through other drive throughs with my kids as well, whether you compare it to a Wendy's uh, or McDonald's or whatever it is, it's painful. <laughs> it's actually very, it's, it's a painful experience because you're waiting and waiting. There's a Wendy's by us. It takes forever to go through the drive through And I say to my son, I'm like, this should be a SCAD Pro project right here. <laughs> yeah, boy. And, and uh, talk about it, it. So basically you're saying they're building trust and loyalty through a frictionless experience, right? Customer experience. And in this case, you used a great term. You, you said fidgetal, right? Because it's a combination. It's the digital tablets and the ability to take the order, That's transmit right. that into the restaurant. I think they take payment on the tablets too, right? So you literally just pull up and get your order at the window, correct? Yeah. That's exactly right. They take payment and you can also get your reward scan. You can bring up the app, you can scan the app, you can redeem your rewards right there as well. So yeah, it, it is a truly a fidgetal experience. Yeah. I love that. I love that word. You can send me the royalty. Okay, great. We may have to do a blog post or something. <laughs> like that. That, that's just too good. Um, and, and what a lifesaver that was for Chick-fil-A during the pandemic, right? When, when in, door dining. I mean, that was the one place and it was crazy. We, they were a client. I was working for a company in the mobile space and they were a client at the time. And we were trying to come up with ways to improve the curbside experience because they just couldn't get enough people processing through it. Talk about lying down on the street. It became a real problem for Chick-fil-A during the, yeah. uh, during the pandemic. Yeah, exactly. Same thing happened while we were at Home Depot. So when the pandemic hit, we were caught a bit flat footed. We didn't have curbside pickup. And we knew that this was coming. And you know, there was a point in Home Depot's history where they didn't necessarily think curbside pickup was on brand, even though other companies were already doing it. Uh, the beauty of this project though, is like, A, we had to do it because this was now the new normal. Two, this is what the customers demanded and was expecting. But three, the best part of all of it is that it was highly complicated. You had about 50 different teams working together. It just wasn't UX and engineering and product. It was supply chain and logistics and brand managers and managers within the store and who had different staging areas within the stores. Not every single parking lot was set up the same way. So it became very entrepreneurial in a lot of ways as well, too, because you had some managers taking a Home Depot bucket, a yardstick and a handwritten side curbside pickup this way. And we started very small. It was really those one rare instances where leadership gets out of the way and actually allows you to do the project because we had to get it done. Uh, so we started small with five stores, then we went to 10 stores, then we went to 100 stores, and then we scaled to all stores. And it was a huge success. And so we did really well. And we also ate our own dog food, frankly. We were going out and doing the drive through ourselves to see how good the experience was, to bring that information back, to iterate, test, get better at what we're doing. How can we refine while marketing caught up and was able to print out the more branded signs and information about this is your way to... Um, curbside pickup or also in the app, like, where's my parking space? How do I get there? How, how are they gonna put the things inside my trunk? Uh, so that, I'm really proud of that experience because we had to do it quickly. We launched it only within a few weeks. And again, it's one of those, it was one of those experiences where we got through corporate obstructionism and we got something through pretty quickly in the market. And you gotta love that as well too, because innovation is really authorized in larger companies. And so you really have to find those people that are gonna to band together. And we almost had like this secret society of like-minded people knowing that we had to get curbside pickup into the market. Otherwise we were gonna suffer. And we did, and we launched it successfully. That's awesome. And, and when you think about the curbside experience that you did at Home Depot to adapt to that, how did digital fa factor into that, the digital experience to get the true digital, if you will? Yeah, it was all done in the app. So that okay. was really the key experience. I'm also mobile web too. so. Again, the experience would be you would and most of our transactions at Home Depot started on your phone anyway. So that's where the transaction was starting. But it was all done through mobile web and the app and creating that experience within there that people can go and choose their pickup at checkout, say, hey, I want to do curbside. And they would come through. And yeah, at some point there was even a phone number you have to call to let you know. That's how early on in terms of the iterations. Right. So it was it was not good and that's okay because the thinking was let's not let great get in the way of good let's get something into market let's get an mvp out there we'll test and learn and we get better it's better than having nothing right so i'm really proud of what we did because you know we listened to our customers we listened to each other and said hey we need to improve upon this very very quickly so we were able to stay agile uppercase a and lowercase a in terms of getting into market 
Yeah, which which was a requirement for the pandemic because it caught everybody flat footed. And so, yeah, I, I I tried a few of those. I tried a curbside with the grocery store here, and and I'm like, okay, I ordered in the app, and they're like, okay, well, what do I do? And I get there, like, well, pull in one of the spaces and call the number on the sign. I pulled into the space, and the sign said satisfaction guaranteed. That's all it said. It didn't. It didn't have any phone number. It didn't. I'm just sitting in my car going, I don't know what to do. I don't actually know what to do. So I literally had to get out of the car and ask somebody what how to get my order out to the curb. So I think I think another thing that a lot struggled with, a lot of brands struggled with in that time, was being able to communicate that you were doing it on the purchase path itself. So a lot of that that experience that you would see. A lot of that aesthetic that you would see would, would just say, pick up at the store. But then in the actual checkout flow, you would have the opportunity to say curbside pickup or in the order confirmation, you would have it, but no one was setting the expectation in the journey in the actual user journey. I shouldn't say nobody, but sometimes people wouldn't set that expectation and building that expectation through the entire path that, oh, I can do this curbside pickup. That's so much better than having to go into the store, especially when you have to deal with the, the pandemic. That's a great point, Nick. And that leads into excellent customer experience because that comes back to content strategy. And, and I'm not talking about marketing fluff content. I'm talking about very explicit directions of where to expect it, where to see it, what to do, uh, and creating this don't make me think mentality like, okay, I tap this to go here, or I want to do pickup, or I'm going to have it delivered to my home, or I'm going to pick it up in a locker or whatever it is. Good content strategy is the science behind the storytelling. Content strategists should be working directly with information architects and designers and researchers to figure out where should that message go. And so having something like that is about having the message in the right place at the right time to take out the confusion, to take out the friction and kind of take this, don't make me think, what do I do here? Do I tap this? Am I supposed to do something here? What is this interaction? Anytime you have a speed bump like that, then something's wrong. Yeah, that's very interesting. That That's exactly what aesthetics inside those friction forces is about is being able to set up that expectation that you know what to do. And then the usability side of it comes next. As long as it's it's giving you the expectation of what to do, and then the usability is what you would expect. Now, all of a sudden, you have a good journey. And so those two marrying together in a, a nice harmonious way is, is what we would ex expect and want to pursue. Agreed. It, it should be intuitive. You should get it at a glance. You shouldn't have to study it. And if it has to be explained, like sometimes you see like these chalkboard overlays or what else are really long directions about how to use something. If you have to explain it, UX is kind of like a bad joke. If you have to explain your joke, your joke probably sucks. <laughs> and it's kind of the same thing with UX. If you have to explain your UX through a chalkboard or a long PDF, your UX probably sucks too. So, you know, you, <laughs> it's, it's all about being explicit, being clear, using plain English and using good heuristics to be able to create a, a frictionless experience. And, and as few words as possible, because people don't read a lot of copy anymore, right? <laughs> no, people don't read. They skim or right. they glance. So less is more. And that's something I've always you know, talked to my people about as well, too, whether it's writers or UX writers or content strategists uh, in general, is basically cut it in half and cut it in half again. I feel like you just called me out, Chuck, for never reading the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think the new expression now is TLDR. So everybody prompts right. it. Like, Here's the TLDR. And I had to look that up once. And I was like, when I first saw that, I was like, did somebody forget to close a tag on HTML or something? I was like, what is, what is, what is that? What is that glitch right there? It's funny. Yes. Yes. That, that's your nickname, uh, Nick. TLDR. TLDR. Great. So... You know what? I'll, I'll, okay, wear good. I'll wear it. So, <laughs> so Paul, you've actually touched on so many aspects that sound like they all relate back to aesthetics. You've talked about content. You've talked about heuristics. You've talked about, you know, how it kind of connects with the user experience. In your words, how do you think about aesthetics? What are all those elements that go into it? Because a lot of people think aesthetics is design. It's how, does it look good, right? Yeah, and unfortunately, that's the way business leaders think too. You know, sometimes creative teams get tagged to be the team that makes T-shirts and logos. Right. And you don't want to be known as that that team. You want to be the no, you want to be known as the team that drives value and business value at the end of the day. So the way I think about design is really the expression of creativity and great thinking that should be attached to some sort of business value investment or strategy. So that way, when we actually take design, we're thinking about taking it to a strategic level and saying what we are creating creates this kind of value. We talked about uh, curbside pickup and we had the numbers and the data and the outcomes to show that this drove this amount of sales or this amount of pickup. So anytime you can map 
uh, design back to some sort of investment, KPI, OKR, whatever it is, now you're having a much different conversation because that's what business leaders care about. How are you affecting my P&L? So I like to think about, look, process is important in terms of design, sure. But if you're a design-led company and we know who they are, you're going to beat out the S&P by 228% like they've been doing for the last 10, 15 years. Look, Home Depot will never be a design-led organization. It's a merchant-led organization, it'll always be. And they're printing money right now, which is great. However, we did such a great job of taking design to a strategic level, that's where you really start making the impact. So when I think about design, I think about it more as a strategic component that drives value for an organization. Because once I can show the value of what we're delivering, that depoliticizes the conversation. And we're talking less, more, talking less about aesthetics and talking more about actual value, whether that's qualitative or quantitative. That's awesome. On the flip side, do you have a way of quantifying when friction gets in the way and when design is in the aesthetics aspect of it? Is there a way to quantify that? Yeah, I think there's a number of measures you can use, whether it's bounce rate or scroll depth or time on page or time on task uh, or getting stuck somewhere. You know, So you can see where people are dropping out of the funnel. We were really good at that at Home Depot in previous jobs. We knew exactly where people were dropping or even our testing. And you know, that was something we were really good at as well was user testing and making sure we were putting in, uh, experiences in front of users first to see what were the pain points, what were the kinks, what was not working, what didn't they understand. And that's absolutely key. Companies that are not doing that right now, you're just throwing up a Hail Mary and a guess. You have to really be out there and understand the wants, needs, frustrations, pain points, behaviors to really craft a, an amazing experience. That all should be prompted by great research as well, too. So if you have good research going in and you understand those behaviors, you're going to have a much experience coming out the other side. Um, so it really comes down to measurements through you know, different platforms that tells us exactly where are we losing users, where are they dropping, what's not working. And then through qualitative as well, through platforms like usertesting.com, where we get actual gold and truth and feedback from users about, hey, I'm stuck here, or this doesn't make sense, or this doesn't work, or hey, this is great. Or you get those moments of surprise and delight as well, too. And that's where you know and you create innovation. When you see the eyes light up and you see that magic moment, that's where the innovation happens. That's awesome. So what are, um, what are some favorite design experiments, if you can talk about them, that you've run with SCAD students to improve the brand's online experience or digital experience? And, and what were some of the results of those? Yeah, there's not a whole lot I can go into only because they're covered by NDA, but I'll touch on a few and I'll start with Deloitte. Uh, Deloitte's actually our largest client, and we do a lot of amazing work with them. Uh, and this is specifically in government and public sector. And so these are big, meaty, complex problems that students are trying to solve through design. And we come from a point of view that you can solve anything through design. So as you start thinking about projects like child welfare, social security benefits, uh, wayfinding through LAX airport, space launches. I mean, these are big, complex problems. And yet students are coming back with some amazing solutions as well, too. Um, you know, we've launched also furniture into, uh, you know, during the pandemic as well. So we talked about that earlier. We did a project with Mitchell Gold and Bob Williams, uh, where we created work from home uh, furniture of the future. What does that look like? So we came out with three different lines that was put into market. That solves a big problem of what was happening in the world at that time. Uh, we've done projects for Google that covers pixel pay and privacy. Uh, we've got 20 projects going on this fall right now that's in healthcare. Uh, creating new flight suits for zero G. Uh, we're doing some work with CBS Sports. It's going to be amazing in terms of, of terms of what we're doing. So uh, it's amazing to watch the students and what they come back with in terms of forward thinking, future thinking, um, really just uh, unconstrained thinking and and how they're solving problems. Gotcha. And and you know a lot of those things. What's what's really fascinating because I you know we tend to talk in terms of digital experiences, but almost everything we've touched on today has a physical aspect to it as well. So what are those unique challenges when you're marrying physical and digital, or that digital piece? I think the the unique challenge is really making it seamless, and there has to be a reward on the other side as well. Uh, we did a project here in Atlanta at Phipps Plaza where we painted this beautiful mural as what's called the green at Phipps Plaza, where it's this outdoor beautiful courtyard that they created inside some of the, or outside of some of their anchor stores. So we painted this beautiful mural and then we created an interactive experience on top of it using Adobe Aero, which is a relatively new technology for AR. And I'm on the point of view that when you're doing things with augmented reality, 
when you're ta- asking somebody to take out their phone and scan it, there better be something interesting on the other side. It shouldn't just not be doing AR for AR's sake. So when we did this particular project, and this is all public as well too, um, when you bring it out and scan that QR code that's on the painting, you're actually in a 3D world because AR can sometimes be very flat and very 2D. So you're inside this magic garden that's got floral chandeliers and the deers walking by and a woman with a scarf floating in the background and beautiful flowers and vegetation. It's really one of the most beautiful things I've seen, but you're actually in it. So you're walking through it and it's got depth and it's got perspective. So how do you make it seamless? How do you make it connected? But how do you also feel like it's a reward on the other side in terms of, hey, this was something that was delightful, interesting, provided value at the end of the day. Uh, I was at a Drake concert with my son a few weeks ago, and there was a big QR code on the screen that said, pull out your cash app and scan for a prize. I'm like, all right, I'll go for it. And so I didn't win, but my son won. He won 20 bucks. And so I was like, oh, well, that's a reward. That was delightful. That's pretty cool. So there was something cool on the other side, a little gimmicky, right? But at least there's a reward on the other side and saying, hey, you brought out your phone. Pretty cool. You know, that's a great experience. How how can you translate that for, say, a retailer or, uh, you know, a healthcare company? What's What's an example, would you think, in terms of that reward? I love the idea of the reward of making it worth the effort, but what what's an example? Yeah, absolutely. I know we're doing some work at SCAD Pro right now with several healthcare companies, a lot in the VR space too. So there's a big interest in VR, metaverse. So I think, you know, it, it's com- it's combining not only the VR space, but what does that patient care look like in an actual physical space? So what does that handoff look like from virtual reality to actual reality? And how do they intertwine? How is the information sent? What is the patient's perspective when they come in? Uh, how are they made to feel comfortable? Uh, how do they feel like they're getting their problems solved? Right. So that's a big area that we're trying to solve in terms of what does patient healthcare and actual experience look like in the physical world? And how are they being treated in the VR world as well? Um, so we love that because you know, it's, a, it's an interesting space to be in. We think healthcare is a ripe area for this type of, let's say, call it disruption or innovation as well. I, I love the concept of everything can be solved with the uh, design, um, but then you end up referring to a lot of different aspects like uh, uh, rocket launches and spacesuits. And how does design then match with the engineering aspects with something as, as technically, um, I guess, demanding as space travel? Yeah. So I, I can't go into a lot of it, right? But of course. So ju- just to come in that from the side, yeah, when it comes to design thinking, the worst thing about design thinking is that the word design is in the title, right? It's really about a human-centered approach to solving problems. It's also about collaboration and having the right people in the room. So anytime we're doing a project like this, and even when we were at Home Depot or other companies, when we were using design thinking or doing design sprints, it was about pulling all the right people that were part of that problem. It wasn't just designers locking themselves in the room and drawing pictures of a spirit animal in the corner. It was really more about let's get product engineering to keep us honest to make sure that we're not creating science fiction. Can this thing actually really be built? Let's get uh, data science in the room. How are they going to help us? Let's even get legal in the room as well, too. Do we need them? Do we need marketing? Do we need buyers? So it's having the right people in the room to help solve that, to make sure that it actually can be realistic because great ideas come from everywhere. It's just having the right people in the room to help solve that. And that mentality can be applied to any industry, anything you're designing, anything at all, because you're just really saying you're almost designing the process itself around creating the best experience possible by making sure the right people are involved. Exactly. And to build on that, um, one of the best things we did at Home Depot and, you know, look, we were growing at a billion dollars a year in terms of the e-commerce. We grew the mobile app from 700 million to 2 billion over three years. We were doing some pretty amazing things. Really proud of that. But what I'm most proud of is taking design thinking across the organization. So it started very small within the interconnected experience team that I was managing. And you know, starting at a very kind of grassroots level, we started doing design sprints and showing speed to market. We were getting features back into the app or into the experience much faster uh, at, a, at, a, at a lower cost as well, too. Uh, so not only did we start within our own group, but then we started to scale. We started going to HR. We went to finance. We went to supply chain. And all these other groups within Home Depot started coming to us and say, show us the way. Show us how you're solving problems. We even stood up a design thinking 101 through 
um, H, uh, Home Depot University, right? And that, I had people coming in and taking a class. I didn't even know what organization they were with. And, and it's like, what do you do in Home Depot? I attended it. <laughs> Nick was there, right? I was so, there. Yeah. That was when so, I was an engineer. I think, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's where you start to show impact, scale, change behaviors and change mindset. And then really the capstone on all of this is that we did a design thinking facilitation with the ELT. So no pressure, you've got your C-suite sitting in the room and I'm telling my CFO, Richard McPhail, Richard, you need to push past through the obvious. And he looks up at me and he's like, we should be working like this all the time. And I said, I know. And these were big meaty problems that were facing the Home Depot. These weren't just like, we were trying to figure out this feature. These were bigger, larger problems at the ELT level that needed to be solved. So going back to what I was saying earlier, design doesn't even need to be part of the output. It's really about thinking through structure and process. It's about thinking in a different way and solving problems in a different way. What's ELT? <laughs> Executive, Executive leadership. leadership team. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to make sure I knew what you're talking about. So, Sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> See, you guys are insiders at Home Depot. You know what all means. <laughs> Got to take my corporate hat off sometimes. <laughs> So, Paul, what companies do you think, uh, do you believe are really nailing it when it comes to aesthetics and delivering a, an amazing customer digital experience? Yeah. Um, you know, one of my favorite, and it, it's been my favorite for over 25 years, is, is eBay. And I, that's how long I've been part of eBay. <laughs> but it, it's grown with me, and I feel like it's grown to know me in a lot of time. So while a lot has not necessarily changed with the brand, I think a lot of the fundamentals and the ethos of it is still there. They've refined their their mobile app in a way that it is so elegant, it is so easy to use, and it is so personalized in terms of what I like to shop for, what I like to buy, what I like to collect. Um, so I love eBay just in terms of their point of view, uh, but also how they keep me coming back year after year, month after month, day after day. They're doing something right because going back to what we were saying earlier, they were putting the message in the right place at the right time, showing me what I want to see. Um, so I'm a big fan of eBay. Uh, of course, I'm a big fan of Tesla. As you think about aesthetics and disruption in the market and user experience, uh, Tesla has done it very, very well. And I'll go back 10 years when Tesla was just getting off the ground. Uh, I was with a different company at the time and we went to go do a, a deep dive or brand study of Tesla. And we went to a gallery up in Northern New Jersey that had just opened. They don't call it a dealership, they call it a gallery. And walking into the gallery, there was a chassis on the floor and several computers. It looked more like an Apple store. There was mm. no car on the floor, right? So you walk in and there, there's a, a woman standing there and we start digging into her role, her responsibility, but also how she was attached to the mission of Tesla as well too. And really digging, you could see that she was bought in. She's like, look, if you don't want to go to Mars, you shouldn't be working here. Right. And so I found that fascinating in terms of, hey, they're so deeply embedded in the values of what the company is about. That's going to translate into this kind of missionary and mercenary um, employee that believes in the mission of what we're trying to drive, but also in terms of rolling up their sleeves and getting things done. So it really kind of flipped aesthetics. It flipped the experience. It flipped the shopping experience on its head. And if anybody drives a Tesla, if the process is still the same, when you buy your Tesla, it goes into this room and you get a minute to kind of walk around the car and spend some time with the car and get to know it and address the car. All right. So there's this kind of emotional connection. I'm not sure if they're still doing that or not, but that was part of the tour that we got when we saw the gallery. So as you think about Tesla, between the aesthetics, the simplicity and how minimal it is, but how beautiful they are as well. I'm a big fan of what that looks like because it blends, again, that digital and physical digital and physical into a digital, uh, which is pretty cool. Well, and, and one thing that they nailed on the user experience and the frictionless is the charging stations is the Tesla superchargers as a, as a new yeah. EV owner, I've had mine a week, a month and a half. And I just took a trip to LA. We were 10 hours coming back because I had a four hour, I, and I don't have a Tesla. I have a non Tesla, so I can't use the Tesla superchargers. Yeah. I had a four hour delay in Palm Springs trying to get charged up so I could make it back here. So it, 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 and it was enough to say, I'm not sure I'd take another trip in my EV. Tesla owners don't have that issue. They have, they have really perfected that frictionless experience. So you can, you don't get the range anxiety. So perfect example. That's, that's exactly what Elon Musk said leading into it. He said the, the secret of Tesla has nothing to do with the vehicle. It has everything to do with the charging network. And if you look at his, his strategy, and I, I remember looking at it 
uh, six years ago, seven years ago when the model three was just announced or however long ago that was at this stage, but um, he had everything running north, south and east, west and two running east, west, one on the north side and one on the south side so that you could navigate the entire United States. And that is that that was a very open design led thought to make sure that Tesla as a brand could ultimately dominate the EV world. And, and, you know, you're a, you're an anecdotal experience of, of how that's succeeded. An audience of one, perhaps. Yes. <laughs> I find a way to work my book into every, every conversation. Um, the, it, 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 the funny thing is while I was standing there in Palm Springs in a hundred degree weather, waiting to get my car charged and chatting up all the other EV owners that were going through the same nightmare, I texted my nephew who's been looking at EVs and I said, buy the Tesla. The other, the, the non-Tesla has not figured this out yet. <laughs> you know, it, there's an interesting story was on the news a couple of years ago. So the number one state to have EVs is California. The second one is Florida. And a hurricane was coming through over Florida. So when you think about evacuations and people driving, there's not a whole lot of charging stations down in that area. So what happens? What happens to these people that have EVs, they're trying to get out of state and get out of harm's way. Where do they charge? If they have a Tesla and it was an interesting problem. It was like, man, somebody needs to figure that out. If, if Florida is the second largest state with EVs, that's a problem to be solved. You got hurt or you uh, got uh, earthquakes in California. So <laughs> you got all kinds of natural disasters. But, but what I do love about this example, when we think back to digital experiences, the actual digital experience, and I've driven a Tesla, you know, is pretty great, right? They, they've done a lot of things well with digital. What we just talked about had nothing to do with the digital experience. It's all about the, the joy of ownership and making it possible to take a car on a long trip. Cause when you buy a car, you expect to be able to drive it on a long trip and you buy an EV, you're going, I don't want to buy gas where it's seven bucks, you know, in California. I, I mean, so it's, I think it's a beautiful example of that fidgetal where it's the end to end experience and the full customer experience. If you want to build that trust and loyalty. Yeah. You just took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say the same thing that they developed this loyalty, trust, um, an expectation, right. With reliability as well, that I am going to make it to my destination or I'm going to find a charging station or my car is not going to break down or whatever it is. So again, I don't know what that looks like in terms of overall repair costs, but you have to imagine there is a deep loyalty when it comes to Tesla ownership. Indeed. So what are the keys to delivering on great uh, aesthetics and digital experiences? Like if somebody's listening to this and they're going, oh, wow, we need to bring this kind of thinking to our company. How would you approach it from a process standpoint? How do you change that culture and start to think in this aesthetic led design led thinking? Yeah, it's really about presenting the outcome and not the idea. Right. Because like I was saying earlier, you can take your beautiful designs upstairs, but if it's not attached to any sort of business value, investment, strategy, not, nobody's going to care. Right. We got to be able to show what is this actually providing. So, sure, you want to make sure your team is empowered. They have creativity. They're working on new, innovative ideas. Um, they want to feel like they're not the team that's known for T-shirts and logos, but they're creating business value for the for the company. That's great. They should be challenged. They should have career ladders. Um, they should have goals. They have specific insight that's given during design reviews. That's more about the research and less about why was it designed this way. Uh, it's really thinking through how do you empower that team and it should come from the top in terms of leadership and what does that look like. But really to have success and grow design and get the trust and um, the belief that aesthetics can affect it is really how do you map it to some sort of KPI or measurements. And I think that's where some of these innovation hubs fail as well, too, is that it's not it's done in a vacuum. Right. So we hear about the innovation hubs or accelerators and, you know, they usually die out pretty quickly because it's done in a vacuum. It's not mapped to any, any sort of strategy. It's not mapped to any sort of investment. But if I can tie my design work to some sort of investment or capital budget or whatever it is, I can actually prove out I'm going to get more buy in and I'm going to get the trust from our leaders as well, too, because I'm speaking the business of language. That would be my advice to any design team that's really trying to get the, the belief and trying to scale and trying to grow. I can't tell you how many companies I've talked to that have this same problem as well, where the design maturity is really low, right? And that it's really more about, hey, make this pretty versus, oh, we can actually create value for the organization. You know, I in this whole conversation, the, the big thing that's that's kind of overwhelming 
me at the moment is to say we probably need to elevate our our uh, friction forces to just mm. don't call it aesthetics and call it design. That seems yeah. to be a, a more applicable way to think about it because this this conversation is just it's it's well beyond what I anticipated. No, I, I, and I appreciate that. And look, you know, you have to invest in your people, first of all, and make sure that you build the trust with your people and your design team. Uh, having design principles and everything that you can rally around in terms of uh, the things that you believe in and stand on, uh, believing in the core values of the organization, going back to what I was saying earlier about missionary and mercenary. Uh, but you also can prove out the business value of design and user experience in investing. So we saw a huge spike in terms of UX investment during the pandemic, which was great. And it was gravy train for if, if you're a UX designer. Now in the last year, we've seen the market go sideways and everybody's getting laid off. So whether you're in UX, product, engineering, recruiting, it's a hard market out there. But companies really have to get on board and understanding that UX can improve performance, reduce errors, increase ease of use, attract more users, increase adoption rates, elevate the brand. So these are all qualitative things that you can bring to your leadership. Say, this is why we should be doing it. So you have to tell that story up. You have to convince leadership that there's value in this. And that's where you're going to get that ROI. That's where you're going to get that trust. You use a great term. You said the language of business, right? It's that you've got to convert it from <clears throat> a design and creative to the language of business that the CEO will get. Yep, exactly. He doesn't care about the pixel perfect mock-up. He cares about what are you driving for my business and how are you solving these problems? And yet the irony is <laughs> design is such a personal thing. And it's having led marketing in a lot of companies, it's, I always joke, you know, the CEO never tries to be the lawyer if he's not, a, you know, never tries to do the legal team's job, but they always mm -hmm. think they, they know design, right? Because design is such a personal thing. And I love what you're talking about, bringing it back to metrics and bringing it back to outcomes, business outcomes changes that whole conversation. It almost doesn't matter how good it looks at that point. It's how good of experience the customer has with it. Agreed. And if you include your leaders early on in the process and get buy-in, you're going to have a much better time selling it through. So you should be talking to them at the research level. So if they're hearing about the research and the pain points, and what I always like to say is, show me the pain, right? And if we can show who doesn't want to know about their customers and where the friction is. So if you can bring that to leaders and show the pain and get the buy-in early and feel like they're part of the process included, that's where you're going to get additional buy-in as well too. Um, so you know, going back to what we were saying earlier, having your team empowered to do so is going to feel like they've got skin in the game, right? And they feel like they're working towards something bigger and they're part of the mission, uh, which allows them to do great work as well. So you have to celebrate those heroes uh, and people that will really drive those through. And if you can find that executive evangelist within your organization, uh, what we call the godfather or the godmother, this is something we talked about in my Punks and Pinstripes Network group, is that if you've got the godfather or godmother within your organization that's going to part the sea so you can drive a Mack tr truck through in terms of innovation or new ideas or outcomes, that's the person you want on your team uh, that's also willing to take a bullet for you as well too. Right, so that's your bulletproof vest. And we had that at, at Home Depot through my boss, Pratt Vamana, who's now the chief digital officer over Target. He was our godfather and he drove innovation like a Mack truck through Home Depot. And you got that person, that's terrific because that's going to help with innovation and getting the buy-in because they're willing to take a risk and they're not going to say no to an idea. You know, you mentioned punks and pinstripes. I've been following that uh, mentality ever since I first saw you present that of five years ago? When, when did you start that? That was uh, such a cool thing that, that you joined or did you even start Punks and Pinstripes? Uh, Greg Larkin started the CEO of Punks and Pinstripes. And he and I met about five years ago at the How Design Conference. And he wrote a book called This Might Get Me Fired. And I was so inspired by that book because everything that was in that book we were doing at the Home Depot was just different language. And yeah. so whether it was fighting corporate obstructionism, working in a company where innovation wasn't necessarily authorized all the time, finding the godfather, creating a secret society of design thinkers as well, and going across an organization, almost like a Trojan horse, and coming in and changing the way people worked, it was pretty much word for word. And so Greg and I became fast friends, and then he started Punks and Pinstripes and recruited me and about 50 or 60 others as well too, which we like to think as rebels in the boardroom, where we're yep. creating change and innovation, and people like us are unconventional and you need that to create innovation because there's probably a whole level or line of leadership that needs to retire and you need punks to come through to be able to create change and innovation. 
in a company. Otherwise, you're just going to be doing stuff the same way we've done it. And that's the last thing you want to hear in a company. Yeah, no doubt. I've followed it very closely because I, I very much associate myself to that mentality where, you know, I'm not afraid to say the things that no one else is willing to say. I'm not afraid to um, speak up when everyone else thinks it's taboo, that kind of stuff. So it feels like that that kind of falls into that same mentality. Yeah, agreed. You have to have the fortitude to be able to do that and the courage. Um, and you have to be smart as well, too. So it's right, finding those individuals that can provide that that ring that will help you push through as well. So yeah, I've been through that. I've been called unconventional pretty much throughout my career. And I like that because creatives look at things a lot differently. And so I appreciate that. I like being called unconventional, but not to the point where I'm being stupid in an organization either, but you have to take chances. Nobody risks anything when they say no to an idea. That's a great line. So what do people get wrong about aesthetics and digital experiences? Uh, that it's really about how it looks, right? So it's not about how it looks, it's about how it works. And I'm quoting Steve Jobs there, of course, right? So it's not only about how it looks, but design is important because it creates trust in the beginning. If you come into a website, and I think we all have that gut reaction, if something looks sketchy or something looks weird or off or maybe unprofessional or whatever it is, and it doesn't have that tightness in terms of aesthetic, brand style, or some sort of consistency through a design system, you're going to know. And I think all of us are technically savvy enough to know, like when we come through, it's like, I'm not sure about this. So you've got only a few seconds to create trust with an organization when a company comes through. So that's where design is important because it does, you have that moment of judgment when somebody comes in, it's like, mm, I'm in, nope, looks sketchy, I'm out. But it creates that uh, emotional connection. It creates that trust, that belief. Um, and also that this is something I want to engage with. Uh, so I think that's where design really plays an important part. That's awesome. So what's one final thought you want to leave our listeners with? One final thought. Um, like I said earlier, present the outcome, not the idea. I'll reinforce that. I know I said that earlier, but it's so important because that's the way you're going to solve problems. That's the way you're going to break through corporate obstructionism. That's the way you're going to create innovation, right? To build on that, and Nick would appreciate this as well, is that the data will set you free. Right. So anytime that you come with that information, you better be bringing the data with you. Right. So it's not only about the aesthetics and the design and how it looks and works, but here's the data that shows it, whether that's research, qualitative or quantitative, whatever the KPIs yes. you're showing, the data will set you free. Well, this has been an awesome conversation, Paul. Where can listeners find you? How can they reach out to you? Touch base. Yeah, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, happy to make the connection and the network. Uh, you can also find me at SCAD, Savannah College Art and Design. Feel free to email me at pstonic at scad.edu. Today, Paul emphasized the power of design thinking and solving real world problems faced by every brand, the importance of frictionless user experiences and the impact of design on business success. To recap, here are three frictionless ideas to take the smooth path to trust and loyalty. Number one, an excellent customer experience comes back to content strategy, and it's about having the message in the right place at the right time to remove friction and not make users think too hard. One notable success was improving the experience at Chick-fil-A by applying design thinking principles and transforming the fast food chains drive through dining into a frictionless, enjoyable, fidgetal experience. Number two, connect design to some sort of business value investment or strategy. Paul talked about how aesthetics, usability, and overall design connects with the user experience and should be aligned with your business goals. This way, you can show how your design is affecting your P&L. By demonstrating the positive impact of design on the bottom line, companies can make a stronger case for investing in design thinking. Paul points to companies like eBay and Tesla, which excel in providing personalized, elegant digital experiences as top examples of this approach. Number three, to deliver great aesthetics and digital experiences, a company needs to change its culture and start thinking in this aesthetic-led but design-led thinking. By demonstrating the value of design and user experience and involving leaders in the early process, companies can break through corporate obstructionism. Number three, to deliver great aesthetics and digital experiences, a company needs to change its culture and start thinking in this aesthetic-led, design-led thinking. 
By demonstrating the value of design and user experience and involving leaders early in the process, companies can break through corporate obstructionism and drive innovation. Remember, one of the biggest flaws with design-led thinking is designs in the name. It's all about business value. And on a final thought, Paul's unconventional approach to innovation and his emphasis on creativity and collaboration serves as an inspiration for those who are looking to drive change through design. Thanks for tuning into this episode of The Frictionless Experience. Remember to follow us on your favorite podcast player app so you can automatically receive notifications when we upload new episodes. And be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts and let us know what you think and what topics you want us to cover in future episodes because we'd be happy to cover anything that might be causing you friction. And of course, you can find and connect with me and Nick on LinkedIn.